Welcome everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Mubin Azar. Uh, for the first time in Sheffield, you are going to see on this stage live action role play. You're not really. This is called real <laughs> drama, but it's not that kind of real drama. This is uh, a session uh, about access and the future of the access doc. There is a, a ton of competition when it comes to access docs. We have probably more access on our TV screens uh, right now than we ever have done. We have uh, police, we've got supermarkets, uh, we've got John Lewis, we've got a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but how can we continue to make that fresh, particularly when we have uh, declining linear TV audiences and younger people are, are moving away from, from linear TV? So how do we continue to get that access and bring it to our screens and engage people this session today is going to be uh, about how you get the access, how you win it, but also then how you make a program and how you turn that into a returnable uh, format, effectively. And to answer these questions, I have an amazing panel with me. So uh, first of all, I've got uh, Claire Sillery, who is the BBC's uh, head of box, heading the biggest commissioning team uh, across the BBC. I think it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm responsible. <laughs> I haven't counted everybody then. I think it's the biggest team across <laughs> all of the biggest commissioning team, yeah. So, uh, and responsible for uh, super hits uh, across BBC One, all the way to global brands like Storyville. Uh, so, Claire, very pleased to have you with us. Uh, I've got Colin Barr with me, BAFTA, and uh, Emmy winning exec producer and creative director of Expectation Factual. Mm -hmm. You're going to be talking about murder 24 7. Yep in a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, David Hodgkinson, who is responsible. In the past, you worked on things like Reported Missing, 999, What's Your Emergency? Uh, and I think you're going to be talking about forensics, yeah. the real CSI, which I think is probably the, the latest kind of access hit across the BBC, which has done amazing stuff. Uh, we've got Nick Hornby with us who isn't, as I thought, the author of About a Boy. <laughs> and, and there's one no BAFTA. I thought you were cancelled. Yeah. He never but, gets tired of no, it. It's a good job, isn't it? It's good. Uh, but is uh, the CEO of uh, Optimum and was a former commissioning head at uh, Channel 4, if I'm not mistaken. And you're going to be chatting about uh, In Style, which is in production at the moment, uh, fairly early on, isn't it? Correct. Like you're a few weeks in. And we've got Sophie Leonard with us, who is the director of programmes at Minnow, was the exec on Valley Cops, which is yeah. coming back, isn't it? It is, yeah, the very new soon. Name, I think. Yes, yeah. Uh, and today you're going to be talking about Manktopia, yes. which is also in production right now. Yes. Uh, and it's a six part series. Four. Four part series. You can do six, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, and it's in production right now. Yeah, halfway through. Very good. Yeah. Uh, and I am Abin Azar, I'm a journalist and filmmaker. Most recently, uh, I've been involved in a six-part series called Hometown, uh, which is coming to your screens in a couple of weeks. Uh, before we dive in and get into the kind of meat of this session, you will notice under your chairs, or on your chairs, there's a pen and a bit of paper. So I would really like you to be as audacious and out there as you possibly can. And I want you to write down your, your dream access or where you'd like to see an access doc uh, goal really and you can be as out there and I'd like you to be rowdy if you can be rowdy be as rowdy as you possibly can if you want to take ownership of the idea put your name on it <laughs> if you're a bit worried that the idea <laughs> might be a bit ridiculous then perhaps don't put your name on it um, we'll collect those up in five minutes but before we get to that uh, to kind of get those juices flowing and to inspire you let's look uh, at some of the latest access hits and some upcoming access hits across the BBC. There's some brilliant stuff on there. I mean, across the access, you've got stuff uh, dealing with the police, you've got stuff dealing with the fashion industry, um, there's uh, stuff to do with true crime stories. I guess access is, is the key linking word. Uh, Claire, how many times a day do you hear the, the A word? And, uh, and when you hear the A word, how do you distinguish between someone saying, yeah, I've got really special access, and you knowing that it's, it's something worth investing in? Uh, we hear the A word a lot. The team are all here, actually. So if you multiply that by five, that's a lot of times a day. 
Um, but as you all know, it's a hard one thing, access, so it comes and goes, that you might have access for some months and then it falls away and then another indie will come in and pitch the same access. So it kind of ebbs and flows and you get used to the sort of the disappointment of it ebbing and flowing. <laughs> but in general there are two there are um, there are two main conversations about access. So there's the conversation which is just that access that you just you chew their arm off for. You chew I chew your arm off for, which would be, I don't know, IKEA I was very keen to have. I think it took more three years to get that access and it's a big global brand there's a there's a big story it's about something else um, other than just being inside one of those shops one of those blue and yellow boxes and um, it's a massive global story so it's really good access for BBC Two or I don't know inside the foreign office how often you pitch that I'm gonna say yes to that with things as they are in this country that's an amazing bit of access at the point when we're you know, looking at our position in the world and renegotiating our position in the world. So that's, there's that, but that is relatively rare. And then the other type of conversation is the conversation which, is, which comes with sort of intent, which is, this is the approach that we would like to take. This is the story that we would like to tell using access. And a lot of those brands and the brands that are most mm -hmm. successful come from that conversation rather than the, this is the access we've all been waiting for. Absolutely, and I think the thing that jumped out, David, with uh, forensics was that it was, in many ways, it's a story that we think we've seen before, we've all seen true crime stuff, but what you I think, managed to do and was really obvious is you'd taken out the emotional narrative, which for a lot of people would be the obvious starting point. So um, how did you get to that idea? Where did that idea come from? How were you going to tell a story that we all think we know, but in an entirely different way? Well, I think definitely it was about, especially if you're going to kind of try and do returning brands that aren't about some one-off amazing special bit of access that you might get once. You know, there are places where that works and there are places that deliver really compelling human stories that can also be used to tell us something wider about ourselves and the world. And, you know, these aren't rocket science, their hospitals, their police, and you know, all of the things that other big sort of maybe BBC One dramas look at, but increasingly they've been explored so well, um, and I think there was a real intention, and it, um, I'm not taking credit for it because it wasn't my initial idea, but there was a real intention with forensics that we would go into a world that we knew very well from TV drama and that we also knew increasingly well from documentary, um, and try and look at it from a different perspective, from a different point of view, and see that same story through the eyes of other people working in it. And what was kind of interesting and hard about it was that, I don't know if anyone's ever done a multi-camera shoot and something good happens and all the cameras are kind of drawn towards the exciting bit and no one's got the cutaway you need, but you know, when you're in the middle of something, it's very easy to be drawn to the most obvious and the most exciting. And I think we still had to film the um, detectives' work because they are, that is the kind of narrative thread. They are piecing together the case. They're going to get the outcome. They're going to get the result. And both in the process of filming it and in editing it, it was very easy to be drawn to that because it's very appealing, because it does deliver emotion, because it does deliver kind of, you know, it's compelling. And constantly trying to sort of push ourselves away from that and say, we're not looking at that, not because it's been looked at before, and we're going to look at the science or the scientific narrative or the work of the people who your eye isn't immediately drawn to in that moment. And I think by doing that, and with the help of Claire, actually, who was very good in the edit about pulling us back when we got too tempted by the kind of excitement of the detectives, to keep our focus really rigorously on that other unseen bit or less seen bit, and I think that sort of was what brought the reward in the end. It really struck me as well that when you see it, like a lot of brilliant ideas, when you see it finished, it comes across as something that's obvious. You think, oh, why hasn't that been done mm -hmm. before? But it's not obvious, and that's why it's a really, you know, a, a brilliant thing to do. Uh, was it, did, did that benefit your winning of access? Did people understand what you were aiming to do? I think we had, we'd done reported missing with the same press officer, albeit at a different police force. So we had a really good relationship with him. Um, and I think that goes a long way. He was able to vouch for us um, and to help us win trust within the police force. But also what was 
actually good and a really pleasing thing to do is that the forensic -y people had often been filmed on the periphery of detective filming and then there'd be a program and they'd sat down to watch it with their families and they'd be a bit like, mm. you know, <laughs> there they, you know, they, were, they were fleetingly in the background, <laughs> slightly overlooked. Um, and actually, so to go to them as a, with a proposition to say, look, we understand that you've done lots of filming before and we understand it's you know, nerve-wracking and all of these things and you haven't really felt the benefit, but we are going to come and the focus of this is going to be upon you was appealing for them once they kind of bought into the idea that that was going to happen. Having said that, I do think that there is something about the kind of character of a detective, a bravado, a confidence that, and when you, when on this and on other times when I've tried to film with people who work in a scientific field, it's so much about precision and getting things right and also there's so much peer review and judging that actually that, the hard thing was, especially once we went beyond the, to the external labs that the police work with to do their forensic testing, and you know, the results of that testing are so crucial. You know, lives depend on it, people's life sentences depend on it, convictions or otherwise. Um, and so there was a lot of trust to be won there because it... Were, were they scared? Yes, yeah. they, were, they were scared because they didn't want to be seen to do anything that might undermine their work and not only in that instance in that case, but in the kind of wider future of every other time they're called as an expert witness. Amongst their peers and everyone exactly. else. Yeah. And I think in a scientific community, there's also a lot of that, you know, what, you're, you know, what the general public thought about them, to some degree mattered to them less, but what their professional scientific peers thought about them was really vital because that's their stock and trade. Completely. I just want to see a little bit, before we do, uh, this is, a, this is a, a very graphic clip, so if, if you don't like dead bodies or open wounds, then maybe <laughs> look, look away, away for, for a moment. God. I'm, I'm just really cute. Yeah, can everyone? I'm just really curious, did, uh, did your contributors, uh, did they like what they saw in the end? Did they like what you'd done with it? Um, I mean, there were so many different Kind of, I mean, I think overall, yes, everyone was really happy. I think that was particularly difficult because obviously there was the relationship with the family who had to take a decision to allow us to broadcast that. And that's a really hard decision for anyone to take. Um, but also with the kind of various professionals who are involved in kind of overseeing a post-mortem and there's lots of people, including the coroner who um, effectively owns the body from the time of death until they're buried. Um, the forensic pathologist who's carrying out that post-mortem, and of course the next of kin, and all the ancillary people you know, who are part of that family as well. So um, it was a lot of access negotiation and conversations to get to a position where we were able to potentially film that should it happen, mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of access conversations and negotiations when there was a situation where it was you know, that that was going to happen about whether we could film that particular Was there ever one. a moment where you really wanted to film something and someone said oh, absolutely yeah, totally. not? Did that happen often? All the time, all the time, all the time. So um, loads of rushes that never made it? Yeah, and lots of things that weren't filmed because, you know, we were, because not all of the right things that you needed, you know, were in place. And especially when you're dealing with something like that, there's just so many permissions from various people. And we got lucky, like I think you always need a bit of luck in kind of access docs, in the, it happened when a coroner was working who was happy for us to film with a pathologist who was supportive of the project, you know, understood its aims. Um, and then ultimately with a family who kind of, after the event, given due time mm -hmm. and consideration to discuss it and discuss it with their family members, also kind of believed that there was a worth in doing it. Um, but, you know, similar things happened many, many times and none of those, you know, you need so many little boxes to be ticked. And sure. You got it off. Is there anything that kind of, uh, can you be really specific in terms of what pushed that over the edge and got it commissioned? I can. Um, uh, so Blast did an amazing tape, um, which really had intent, which was about the forensic scientists. Um, and we had had another series called Conviction, I don't know if any of you saw it, mm -hmm. which follows the work of Inside Justice. And I always loved the forensics in that. There was a woman in it who was just amazing on forensics and I could listen to her all day on the detail. It was a really specific way that she would talk about the detail. And so um, the tape was very appealing. Um, and for BBC Two, that layer of content 
is really important. Um, I think it just get, it, it becomes about, it, it delivers something else. You know, I think there are scenes in, in this that we would not have in a police procedural because they would be too much. They would be, they would be there. You wouldn't need them to tell the narrative, mm -hmm. but they're there because of the detail. Um, and so all of that was very appealing for BBC Two. So the combination of content, but a driving, a driving narrative underneath it um, is a very good one for that two. That was the thing. Before we move on, I, I mentioned at the start of the session that we, uh, we want access words or ideas. It can literally be one word. You can take ownership of the idea and put your name on it. If you don't want to, don't put your name on it. And I think uh, uh, someone's going to be collecting these at the end of your role. So please give in us your ideas. Bag, yeah, people in orange t-shirts <laughs> are collecting the ideas in a sick bag. So please <laughs> put them in the sick bag that's coming around. Um, so uh, Colin, can we bring you in? You've worked on lots of uh, police access series, like the detectives with Murder 24-7. Um, how did you go about coming up with a different treatment or something that would feel new and fresh? Well, it felt like um, on, uh, I'd worked on quite a lot of things that were police procedurals and worked with detectives. And, um, but one of the things that had always slightly frustrated me was that we, we never seemed to actually be in the place where a narrative or procedural <laughs> turn would actually take place. Mm -hmm. We were always sort of cobbling it together from whatever material we had. And um, so there were two things that came from that. One was, wouldn't it be really interesting if you could get multiple cameras into multiple places as a murder investigation was unfolding, and then try and commit to those multiple points of view as a storytelling technique all the way through. And then the other thing was that I'd started to get really interested in how teams work together. And how we sort of labor under this misapprehension, especially fed by television drama, that it's all about one lone detective out there fighting the good fight, solving crime, doing the right thing. And, um, and actually the truth is that a murder investigation will typically involve about 50 or 60 people, all of whom have different jobs, lots of specialists, and they connect to the investigation in all sorts of different ways. So forensics is part of that. And when you deliberately spend time looking at those jobs and speaking to those people, you start to see that there's a way of maybe looking at the single narrative of a murder investigation in a completely different way. So it was, it was really about trying to restore the team to something that was generally, or rather put the team at the forefront of the thing um, in a way that would tell people something about how they relate to one another, ideally be in the place when an individual discovers the thing that's significant to the investigation. Mm -hmm. We drew a, I drew a really, well, in fact, we've got it. We've got the that? diagram. Yeah, so don't so put it up yet, hold on, let me we'll, give it a massive We'll look at that up. in a, in a <laughs> moment. But, but, but um, what I want to ask you is, you know, you're talking oh. about kind of, we'll look at the diagram in a moment. You know, it was also in a diagram, basically. The diagram's brilliant. We'll look at it in a second. The, the whole idea of kind of flooding an area with cameras, isn't that slightly terrifying? Because obviously like, with access, nothing is ever guaranteed. But in this particular context, there's so many, uh, variables so you could start off and invest so much in something and it could lead absolutely nowhere so how did you kind yeah, of we did think about that, that. Um, you, you have to uh, the only way you can do it is a production model has to be that there's a trigger for when you then increase the number of people who are actually in there filming so you can't have those people in there all the time so whether that's three cameras five cameras seven cameras you have to pick your moments and in an emergency investigation the reality is that the first four or five days are key. So if you can get your cameras up and running in the f those four or five days, then you can actually start to scale back beyond that point. The real challenge is vetting, because working in police forces now, the vetting is unbelievably um, rigorous. And so what you have to, and you can't just vet 25 people, you sort of have to go in with a pool of 10 people and say, can you vet th these people? It takes three months, and then you have to just draw up on those people when you can. And of course, people go off and get other jobs, and you can't guarantee. Are you talking about the, so? Did a lot of your crew have criminal records to start with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try and we really try and work with as many people with criminal records, especially in police access yeah. series. It really helps. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> considering the system. Do you understand um, the system? No, we don't. But but vetting, but the vetting process, and you know whether you've, if you can be clear to work in GMP, but it doesn't mean that you're clear to work in Essex. So you've got to get vetted each time. So then you'd have a pool of people that you could work with. And then the key was just picking your moments for when you would actually deploy extra numbers in there and then sand it back down again. I really uh, thought there was uh, a real strong sense of, of drama and drama sensibilities. Um, and I think some of that was to do with how it was shot as well. So can, can you tell us about that? Well, I think when, you, when you've got an Access series, um, the Access is the star. I think quite often people sort of think of the Access like once you've got the Access, that's almost like an end in itself. And I think more and more, because there are so few places where we haven't been, that actually the access is step number one. And then you have to come at it and decide, OK, if we've got that access, what is it that we can do with that access that feels like it's not something that people have seen, that it might deliver something to an audience that they haven't seen before, it might offer insights that they haven't seen before. And it feels like if you can't clear that hurdle, then you should probably be asking the question of whether, what, what it is that you're actually trying to pitch mm -hmm. and what you actually want to do with it. I think there are very, very few points of access that will just sell in their own terms. And so for me, I'd like to work across drama and documentaries. And I suppose I really like to steal stuff from drama and put them into docs and steal stuff from docs and put it into drama. Mm -hmm. And you go into drama and they all fetishize documentaries as a storytelling. And you go into docs and they all fetishize drama as, a, as, a, as, as storytelling. And actually, there's so much that we can take from one another. Sometimes, you know, they do their own jobs better because they are those genres. I think there's a slight, sometimes a lazy assumption that if you go into a drama and shake a camera around a lot, it's going to feel really authentic. <laughs> and, um, and that's not the case. I think when I, um, I was at a company called Minnow before I work at Expectation, and we made a series called The Detectives, mm -hmm. and there were various drama companies that wanted to do drama versions of The Detectives. And I remember thinking, well, it sort of works because it's documentary with yeah. some drama techniques in it rather than come in and turn it into drama. So there's stuff to learn from one mm -hmm. another. I want to talk about how it was commissioned in a moment, but should we, um, should we watch a clip first? I just, um, I briefly want to talk about how that got commissioned and there was there was a diagram wasn't there yes there <laughs> was <laughs> <not> the diagram. <laughs> thanks for bringing that up can we see it yeah maybe we can see no, it i mean uh, uh, the only reason for having this was that uh, sometimes I, I find sometimes when i'm you can see it's not a very interesting diagram um, i just sometimes I find like it's it. um especially when it comes to trying to illustrate how a, a process works or how teams interact just being able to say okay here mm. are the people who are involved in an average murder investigation so the line through the middle is the actual crime and the investigation, and then all the boxes off it are the different jobs and different specialists that you encounter. And honestly, it probably did more just to help make the idea clear than any number of words in a, in a pitch document. And, um, and although that doesn't obviously convert naturally into storytelling, what it does say is that you know that you're going to have people who have perspectives that are different who have jobs that are different, who will bring different levels of understanding to it. But the key is you've got a straight line of investigation running down the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So you've got a really clear linear narrative that will just drive you through multiple episodes. And that's the key in that series. Claire, was, was this diagram, did that get it over the line? Did it really? Yeah, because the thought that goes into actually, joking aside about just being a diagram, uh -huh. If you've got a producing brain at all, that mm -hmm. is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the, the thought and the work that has gone into reducing everything to that, mm -hmm. you could write 50 sides and it wouldn't sell it. But I can look at that one sheet of paper, take it in the room and go, look, this is how it works. And you, you know it's going to work. And, what, and the thing, that I, I have to say, the words Michael Mann were also used somewhere in the pitch, yeah. which was about right. pace because we love the detectives and have commissioned the detectives again, but the, one of the hallmarks of the detectives is that kind of scandy noir, a lot of phone calls, a lot of looking at things on computers <laughs> that, that we didn't get because we weren't there when it happened sort of thing. And, and that's its own thing, but it was how would you get more pace into something and more drama into something? It, pace. And this does that. It also promises volume. 
So there would be a way that you could potentially do eight parts of this, and you might have one murder investigation, which following this model might go mm -hmm. across three episodes. Then you might have another episode, which is, say, another murder, which is two episodes, and then a third one, which would take you to eight. And volume is very hard to, to commission sure. in this sort of space. So it's a way of building a brand, potentially. Absolutely. I want to so bring... That, um, was, that was the thinking behind it. That's brilliant. I want to bring Sophie in. With, with something like Murder 24-7, mm. you've got the benefit of uh, blue flashing lights, so there's kind of guaranteed yeah. drama. You've just worked on Manktopia, which is about the housing crisis, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, how did you, how did that idea come about, and how did you treat that in terms of an access doc where there isn't a guarantee of a, a yeah. very clear beginning, middle, and end? Yeah, so I think we wanted to do something about the housing crisis because there's been this, you know, massive boom in gentrification in cities across the UK, but there's also a lot of people who are suffering at the other end of the scale. But the words housing crisis are not sort of immediately, oh, I've got to switch that on and that's going to be a great show and I'm going to really enjoy that. So we sort of thought, instead of making it like homework, how do we tell that story sort of through stealth? And I guess that was how we approached it. Yes, we did go and look for access in the first place. We saw there was a mayor in Salford who has put out a big manifesto to say what we're doing about the housing crisis isn't enough and I'm going to do something different. I'm going to build council houses, I'm going to intervene. And um, so that was our sort of starting point. So we went to see him and we looked at it as sort of council access and we got that access. But then the thing about the housing crisis is it's incredibly complicated. There are so many people involved in it. It's a really like intertwined web of people and oops, sorry <laughs> um, and if we'd have just looked at it through the council eyes and through the policy makers eyes firstly it would have been a bit dry <laughs> um, and secondly you're only telling a tiny part of the story and so what we did was we got to Paul Dennett and then we looked at every single person that interacts with him that he's either working with or who he's fighting against and then we went out from there we actually did a diagram as well <laughs> which was what <laughs> it turned <laughs> you know we yeah. did and we had a map of Manchester yeah. we had the sort of the places so like the town hall and the housing options office and the biggest new tower block being built, which is just going to be for renters, it's not, you're not able to buy it. And then we had Capital Centric, which are another big developer in Manchester, and then we had the people attached to those places, and then started drawing lines on it, and it became a big old mess. And we went, okay, right, this is unique, you know, this is the actual 360. So for us, the access at Manctopia was, you know, we sort of threw the stone in the pond for the council, and then there was just this ripple effect outwards. So we then made our lives much harder by going out and slowly getting every single piece of access that linked it all together. Um, but then there was still that question about how do you make people care about this, and how do you give it drama, and how do you give it heart, and how do you make people root for these people and want to tune in every week? Um, and you realise that housing. Housing's a dry word, but your home and the place where you're from and a place that makes you feel belonging, that's really emotive and we all feel that. And if you don't have a place that makes you feel secure and safe, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's a really horrible thing. And there's Can, can I ask you here. about that? You know, because with that housing crisis, obviously it's got a, a kind of public service heart. And yeah. so when you were approaching people for access, did that help? Did people think, oh, I actually want to let you into my life and my work because I can see how this contributes to a bigger discussion? Yeah, I think people aren't really consciously aware of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. They're happy to tell their story, but I don't think anyone that we're filming with, whether it's from the people working in the housing options office, to the developers, to the estate agents, the landlords, to the um, you know homeless charity, I don't think they understand that they're you know building a bigger picture because to them, they know all their lives are intertwined, but we haven't put it all together yet, and that's going to be our challenge and our responsibility that when we put it all together, that we show how there's this symbiosis and how together it tells you the real story about it um, but no I don't think they we, we've talked about it and people are happy to tell their story but I don't think people that consciously think can, no I don't think they can think we like see it. a little bit of it is that yeah should right? I this is um, so this is Tim he's a developer who works a lot with the council and he is 39 years old and he's a local lad from Manchester and so he obviously is very pro gentrification and he makes really swanky trendy building you know sort of turns old mills into very swanky places with breweries and lovely flats um, but at the same time, he's from Manchester and he cares about the place. Um, but also, I think the other thing we wanted to do is not just show developers as bad is and, you know, sort mm -hmm. of people struggling at the other end as good is, that it's just much more complicated than that. Brilliant.
Um, I, do you think you have achieved what you set out to? Well, we're five months in and uh, we're filming over a year, which is also really important because to show people's lives really changing, buildings going up, down, the skyline changing, policies being implemented, I think you do need a proper chunk of time. So we're about five months in and the thing for us is it is properly a web. I mean, it's everyone's lives cross over. You know, somebody, you hear about this bad thing that's happened to somebody and you go, oh, right, it's connected to them and then them and them. It really is fully sort of everyone's lives are intertwined so um, it is very satisfying from an access perspective when suddenly two things click together and we're like oh we were always told it would work and it's sort of working and it actually is yeah working. but we've still got a long way to go Brilliant. So, i really look yeah. forward to seeing it nick i know your um the production you're working on at the moment is kind of in its infancy isn't it are you just a few weeks into filming is we're about right? four weeks into filming four weeks moment. into filming and when i heard about fast fashion i heard it's formatted access and I, I didn't understand that until I watched a little bit of the clip. And then how, it made sense. Yeah. Then it completely made sense. <laughs> so how do you go about formatting real life? Tell, it, tell us how that works. And what's the premise of the series? Oh, 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 well, um, so the show's about a fast fashion company. It's about a fast rising fast fashion company. Um, I'm no expert on formatting and all of this is done with my kind of co-CEO, Tina Flintoff, who's a true genius of a business. But the principle is exactly the same as the principle of all good documentary, which is you focus on what the good bits are. You're thinking about where's the best bit here, where's the hook, what do people want to watch, and you film more of that. So it's actually no different to David focusing on the forensics for forensics, or Colin going for the team rather than the hero in murder detectives. And here it's about the payoff. Okay, so the kind of the, the whole thing about this business, which is. Um, feels kind of thrillingly televisual is that someone has an idea and they put it into action like that and they get a result like that, yeah? So you're saying that's what the show is. The show is follow a young, thriving, kind of buccaneering company where there aren't loads of committees. Someone goes, I know what, yellow shoes are a good idea. Let's put yellow shoes on tomorrow. We haven't even made them yet. See who buys them, make them, get them out to people. How much money have we made out of yellow shoes or not during the course of this episode? So that is really all the formatting that is needed to make this show be something that knows why we're making this programme about it and mm -hmm. has a hunch about why people might want to watch this programme in one way or another. And am I right in thinking each episode is, it kind of charts the life of the company over, is it seven days? Well, it's, it's going to vary because now we're in the shoot. Of course, right. some things don't get done in seven days, but you need to come back on day nine to do it. So right. kind of, you know, the, the format will evolve with the reality, which is the other kind of key thing is never, ever... I mean, I'm no expert on formats. You should ask Stephen Lambert if you want to know how format works. But <laughs> the, the, the idea is what's interesting in reality and how do we get more of what's interesting in there? So if we're finding from the shoot that... If we use nine days of footage, it's better than seven days of footage. Screw the format, off we go nine days. It's the story of the decision. So you know, effectively what you're doing is hunting for big gambles and telling every bit of that gamble. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, our equivalent to Colin's much more significant Essex murder is a frock and tell the story of a frock in a show. <laughs> Very good. Um, should we watch some of it? Only if you want to. Yeah, go on. Let's watch it. <laughs> Um, is, is it Adam, the CEO? Yeah. You know, there's a degree of that, which obviously it's about their business, but it's also about a bigger question, isn't it? And there's a huge conversations going on about fast fashion. So did Adam and the company, did they feel vulnerable? And how did you still allow, how so, did they so, get to a point where they let you in? Well, so that's a very good question. So life is a journey, I've been, and te <laughs> television and uh, unscripted television is increasingly a very large and up and down journey. So the, you know, at the beginning of this process, um, uh, we had been kind of talking with Claire for some time about looking for the now and the next and the businesses that were going somewhere and not dying on the high mm -hmm. street and how do you get into spaces that are feel good about operating in 2018 or 2019, 2020, rather than moaning about it in one way or another. And 
this world class fashion kind of popped about a year ago for, for us collectively, by which I mean kind of BBC and Optima went, is, is crossing over. It's becoming more than just for the kids. It's like Topshop's dead. This is where we're at. And we started kind of talking to uh, the companies in this space. And at that stage, uh, there was a, uh, a kind of confidence within the business. It hadn't yet gone through its period of the first exposés and what have you. And part of the reason that we decided to be kind of involved, so involved within the style is they were a very aware, awake company that was also growing. So there was a part of it going, we're going somewhere, we've got a story to tell. Part of it was, they were also going, look, we know look, there are, there are issues within this industry that are coming. Some of it is about kind of working practices and what have you, but some of it is about the throwaway culture. It's not, not, nothing to do with the business itself. It's the nature of the society that you're operating in. And being a very young company, which is all very young people, they were very kind of switched on to that. And that's a very important thing, if I may say so, in access negotiations nowadays, mm -hmm. where you cannot stitch people up. Okay, so you have to go, what are your worries? This is what we're going to be doing. We have to solve your problems together during the making of this program in one way or another. And because we've had those kind of explicit conversations, you're not saying just trust me. You're saying we've talked about it. We'll keep talking about it. It is something that is a kind of an anxiety that will continue to be for any business that decides to Sure, open sure. But if I can be really specific, you know, we've often, I think all program makers have those conversations with people where you say, this is going to be difficult, and I'd be lying to you if I said it's all going to be easy, plain sailing. Mm -hmm. But are there bits whilst you've been filming where they've said, this is going to make me look really shitty, so I don't want you to film this? Yeah, but that happens all the time in every single film, and it's like, I look like a dick, I wish I hadn't filmed that, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And you just, I mean, like, the most anodyne place you could ever go to, you get those kind of moments, and guess what, in the fashion world, the tantrums are a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> and you just have to go, stay with me. And you know, a, a core principle behind the show, and a reason why we wanted to make it and we wouldn't have wanted to make it otherwise, is they wanted it to be fun, they wanted it to be interesting, they wanted mm -hmm. it to be good telly, and to be able to be in that space is so enjoyable, I have to tell you, to go, it's boring at the moment, stop being boring, let's do something interesting, da da da, it's, it's actually vital in that kind of space of television, I think, nowadays. That's brilliant. Um, right at the end, in a little bit, we are going to be opening this up for questions, so please uh, do think of what you want to ask. I want to talk now about uh, the power and the future of the access stock. We referenced at the start that we have got declining uh, linear audiences, there's increasing competition. Um, how can the BBC continue to be a, a platform of choice. Can we talk about figures as well? Have you got any figures? Fig oh, God, yeah, yeah I've written down some figures. figures. Yep. I've got numbers. So the thing that's really interesting about um, these brands, um, from ambulance, reported missing, mm -hmm. forensics, um, valley cops, Murder 24-7 hasn't been made yet, so, and Manc nor has Manctopia, so I hope to add them to this list, is that they do really well with a young audience. So. They, they perform well on the channel, so uh, Reported Missing, I think, does about 3 million. Ambulance regularly does 4.5. Yeah, 4. Um, but, but then when you look at iPlayer, what happens? So Ambulance, 9.5 million requests for downloads. And of that, 41% of those requests come from 18 to 34-year-olds. And the average would usually be about 30, 30%. So it's high. These brands perform really well. Reported missing, five million requests for downloads, um, and 47% of those, rather than 31%, come from 18 to 34-year-olds, which is quite extraordinary. And um, uh, what are the other ones I've got? Uh, Hospital, which is on BBC Two, is at 32%, 5.2 million requests, but that's an older channel. Um, than BBC One, which is mm -hmm. a bigger, it, that's a bigger audience in the first place. Um, uh, Drugs Land, which was a BBC Three access series, I don't know if you, if you saw that one, but 5.4 million requests for downloads and 46% 18 to 34 year olds. So these shows really do attract a young audience mm -hmm. for various reasons. 
Uh, one, perhaps because they are brands, you know, you know what it is that you are going to get. I think sometimes access docs can present to the audience as a bit of a sort of a flat edifice of, well, you're telling me this is an interesting place, uh, and I don't really know who any of these characters are, but you're asking me to just spend the next hour with you. That's, it's, it can be quite a big ask sometimes, mm -hmm. and I think that these brands, you know more what you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think that it's also really important for us to have timeliness within them, so something like ambulance, you know, it's not, it's not sugar-coated in any way. There are really big social issues in that, but the young audience will come to it because there's a dramatic narrative. You know, there's a lot of narrative in it. There's a lot of story. Um, and I think there's also a factor in it of, you know, the sort of the quality in the paramedics of that lack of judgment, that kindness mm -hmm. in the mix, that is also attractive. Um, so yes, these are very. This is why we are mm -hmm. increasingly um, building brands like this. Sure. I get, this is a question for for all of you actually. But when um, you're coming up with ideas and you're thinking about access docs, um, do you are there particular treatments you'd give if you're thinking about uh, younger audiences? Because we know younger audiences are 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 falling off in in a lot of contexts. Uh, is there anything in particular? that you'd think of in the context of younger audience? So is, is it essentially about, yeah, it's a good story? Colin, do you want to? Drama and emotion. Are, are, I mean, I'm not saying that's all that a younger audience is looking for, but mm -hmm. I think you can take a younger audience anywhere. Um, and it's not about make, just making things about young people. Yeah. It's about a quality of truthfulness, authenticity, and then drama and emotion. And I think if you, if you can promise that, um, then they'll follow. Whether you're Netflix or the BBC, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, or whatever platform as well. Yeah. Sophie, did you want to say something? Oh, um, well, I, I totally agree. I think a lot of the time people try and patronise the younger audience or sugarcoat things or shy away from mm -hmm. difficult truths. And I think um, tone and humour and truthfulness and not being scared to tell them what it's really like because actually young people are at the cold face of a lot of these issues mental health or joblessness and um, and I do think sometimes people think they have to make a program for young people and I think you don't you just give them the truth and you make it funny and emotional and dramatic and they'll want to watch it brilliant I want to um now read some of these suggestions from you guys. I don't know how many of these, I don't know if you're taking the piss or not really. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Um, I, I want you all as well to think about your own kind of access dreams. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of these out and then I want you to, to raise your hands and tell me, whoever raised their hands first, tell me how you'd make it and who you'd make it for, okay? So the first one is uh, weather spoons. I totally would do weather spoons. Okay, how would you do weather spoons? <laughs> no, because it's the heart of so much. And I like not only the whole kind of obvious Brexit -y thing the other day, but also sort of it's a kind of in the way that Greg's is, it's like mm -hmm. a cultural touchstone for tons and tons of people. And I was reading this really mental thing on Twitter the other day. They've now got this app where you can pay for your drinks. So basically People like you can go. People go to Weatherspoons now. Young, attractive people. Did you people. put that idea? I did. No, yeah. I did not. But I should. <laughs> young, attractive like students would go to Weatherspoons and they'd find it's called like a sub dom financial sort of payment thing. And these they'd send men these pictures and men would buy drinks for their tables. But Weatherspoons is just such a weird cultural. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I totally do Weatherspoons. A bit weird. Okay. Brilliant. You. I mean, you could actually get these ideas commissioned by Claire in this moment. Only with a diagram. So if, yeah. <laughs> Diagram. I'll draw your diagram yeah. how it all works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if this is yours and it goes down well, then please take ownership. All right, the next one. So tell me who wants to take this. Uh, and apparently quite a few people said this. Inside the BBC. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I don't want to do that. Do you want to? No, 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 no one wants to It's commercial suicide. No one wants to watch no. it. No one wants to watch that. All right, we'll leave that one. Uh, so uh, Alcoholics Anonymous Group. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's from uh, Candice Davis. Yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous, who, who would do that? It's the heart of Alcoholics Anonymous that it has to remain anonymous. Yeah. yeah. Which makes it very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's really hard with those sorts of subjects as well, where if you come at them literally through the front door of the thing, it's often the hardest way of getting, like if you want to do something about yeah. alcoholism, mm -hmm. weather spoons is a better way of yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Cheap you know, that, it's hard. It's so hard to do that right through the literal front door of the thing. Yeah. It is, I just want to, <laughs> 
I, I really like this. Jacob Reese Mogg's family. Good. We've <laughs> actually tried it. <laughs> did you actually? Yes. Yes. Yeah. What stage did it get to? Did yeah. You? Well, I mean, they're sort of a, f a fascinating family. Um, did you get to meet them? Probably couldn't discuss much further, but I mean, we, we, we've should been we, there. Should we wait? Is it going to come? It's not you, in the pipeline. You can wait. Because we'll be waiting for a while. Uh, okay, hostage negotiations. That's good. I would yeah, love yeah. Go yeah. on, Colin. Absolutely. How would you do that? I mean, but that, okay, so forget everything I said about there being very few places in the world where just the access alone would do it. But mm -hmm. for me, if you could genuinely access that, mm -hmm. then the access alone would do it. You wouldn't, and you wouldn't struggle to right. find somebody to bite your hand off for of that. The, the reality is, though, when you, I mean, and a lot of people have looked at access into that, it, it's, the reality is really difficult mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, not least because uh, you know, they, they're reluctant to let you in, but actually the reality of how they negotiate is, is tricky as well and, and doesn't present the way that you want it to present. Mm -hmm. But some, I think some of the negotiations that were going on two or three years ago around hostages that have been taken by ISIS globally, mm -hmm. if you could reach that part of the story, it would be incredible. Absolutely. Um, we're going to open up for questions in a couple of minutes. A few more of these. The White House, would anyone take that? I'd take the White House. Yeah, you'd take yeah. the White House. How would you? I don't know how if I'd you do it. Yeah. I'd, yes. I'd maybe point the camera at the president. <laughs> I might as well. Let's um, make this more fun. I, I think this has been done, Formats. but I, I think there's lots of treatments. Uh, a brothel? It's, it's done. Been done. It's been, been done. done a few times, yeah. Uh, MI5? Again, the reality of MI5 it's, is... Yeah. Yeah. You've filmed so much and show so little, it'd be, yeah. it'd be very painful. But if you could, it'd be good. And I guess this is the same as inside the BBC, it's inside the TV industry. God, no. Yeah, no one wants Ooh. to do that. We don't like that idea, sorry. So, um, <laughs> just uh, briefly, what, could you give us your dream access, starting with you? Uh, so, uh, Megan and Kate would be my dream access. Oh, wow. Yeah, especially Thank now. Yeah. Are we good? Colin? So, I've got two. One would be jury room. I'd love to get access to a jury room. And the other would be Cabinet Office Briefing Room A, also known as Cobra. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be in there. Brilliant. It's not uh, okay, Megan, obviously. Um, this I is a really lot of pressure, like isn't it? Because everyone's going to no, run off no. and try to... Well, there's a couple of things. The first thing that I'd really love <laughs> as the follow-on to Forensics, the next series, would be Coroner's Courts. Because I think that... I know it's been done to an extent, but there's never been full access I don't think to coroner's courts and that the justice system it's so interesting um, the kind of cases that go through coroner's courts because I think people it's like the people's justice it's almost you, people can speak they can ask questions of witnesses um, and I think it's just fascinating um, and that I think that increasingly people aren't getting justice in the criminal courts and you can, although you can't ask the question why in a coroner's court, it's as close as you can get to the why for families. So I would love that, I think. And all around the country, I think it would be fascinating. I think it's and that. And also, I'm also obsessed with stories. I know this is a little bit of a cop-out, but every so often there's a story that happens and I just think, how would you have been inside that story? Where would you need to position yourself to get those type of stories. So I look at stories like the Charlie Gard story where these evangelists arrive from America and sort of swoop in on a family in a, in a situation with Great Ormond Street. Those kind of things I look at all the time and think, where would you have to be to get that? Or I don't know if you, this is a slightly different one, but do you remember the, the big rape uh, case trial that was happening in Belfast last year? It was a fascinating, I, I know that you can't be in the trial, but I was looking at that story thinking, that story told you more about the values in Ireland than, you know, lots of things grow under the, 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 the troubles and violence creates this sort of, um, this big tree and underneath it all sorts of things grow that are never talked about. So it's that access to a world to through a story. Yeah, those stories. Well, I started to think where else in the country would you go to find a story which tells you about the values of that place very particularly. Uh, it wouldn't be a rape trial necessarily, mm -hmm. but where else would you get something that would be flushed out in that way? I know that sounds a bit like reverse engineering, but I sort of get story envy sometimes <coughs> and think, mm -hmm. how would you engineer that? 
That's brilliant. Thank you. And David? Um, I mean, like, out of the world dream access, no one would watch it, but I'd be interested in, like, really high-level Google or Facebook access, just because I think they're having a really interesting impact mm -hmm. on our whole world right now, and sort of seeing it from their perspective would be good. But actually, do you know what I think the most exciting thing, which is starting to happen more, is you used to go, well, I've got access to this thing, and I'm going to make a film about that. And actually now increasingly, and I'll be really interested to see what 72 films have done with their justice system, but once you've explored those worlds really well, as we increasingly have, understanding that none of those things happen in isolation, and so that kind of multiple access to a whole load of interlinking organisations or groups or whatever, because you know a hospital doesn't work separately from the GP service that surrounds it, or from the ambulance service, or whatever that is, and so I think kind of really big interlinked access mm -hmm. where you look at the interrelation between things is kind of maybe where things are going more. And that feels, although um, exhausting, um, also quite exciting. Brilliant. And Sophie? Um, off the back of that, I'm going to say the Beckhams. Yes. <laughs> I honestly think that they, you know, they get written off a lot, but they're a multi, well, they're a billion pound brand now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're a massive success story, but yet yeah, we do write them I off. I think that's going to happen. I think it's gonna, someone's going to do that. We'll, it's gonna we'll try. <laughs> we've, uh, I think we've got about five minutes and there's a mic floating around. Uh, so has anyone got any questions? And we'll get a mic to you. Just put your hand up. Anyone? Go on. Yeah, uh, two at once. Uh, should we go there first? Yeah, just here. Thank you. Hi, so Peter here from uh, Media Insurance Brokers. Um, I just wanted to say that Weatherspoons was my uh, idea. So oh, well <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> Very good. Um, basically, I've been going in there working in the morning before meeting sometimes because it's free refill, refill coffees, so it's quite good. Um, but it's amazing the amount of different people that go in there for different reasons. So there's people at nine o'clock in the morning drinking beer. Um, there's obviously old women having cups of teas and stuff. And it's amazing if you listen out all the different little stories and it's quite a good community. So, yeah. Peter, I'm so pleased you took ownership. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I think we had someone here. Um, <clears throat> uh, Nick, you said that you worked, you were discussing with Claire about the fast fashion series. Yeah before it kind of went ahead. So I was wondering how that conversation started. Yeah. Um, did you go in with an initial idea and then it developed into that? And, or, you know, how, do, how it all happens? Um, so, uh, it, Tina and I are sort of quite poppy, vulgar people who like bright, <laughs> bold, pink things, basically. And um, we'd, been, we'd been talking, like, a couple of years earlier about getting into shopping and consumer, the consumer world, but making brilliant docs in there rather than shit documentaries in there, which is what happens quite often. And we nearly did one, and then we blew the access. It was quite appropriate to this story. And then just went away. So we were in a completely different space, but it was another booming industry. And... Because of that, we were, there was always like kind of something, there was the one that got away, if you like. And it was commissioned, actually, wasn't it? Or was it was commissioned, commissioned yeah. yeah, unfortunately. And, and it fell down. Was, they wanted us to film it in three days, a six-part series. So, <laughs> the, so, so about a year later, it was going, actually, we, all, we know we love this space. We know we love this space of speed. We love cheap. We love what people are buying. People who understand our viewers better than we do, in a way. Um, and that thing that was a small industry now feels like it's broken into a big industry. And then the conversation was more about how do we do that? How do we make something that is something other than a pedestrian, follow along, bit of stuff, happens series? And that, and that took a bit of working out. It's brilliant. Guys, I'm being told we have to get out of the room. There's a oh, red oh, flashing sorry. light in front of me. Do we have to go? Or do we, don't we? So thank Can you all for attending. Shall we take one more question? Oh, go, so on. go on, just really quickly. If it's quick, and we'll get a really quick answer. Go on. Hi, my name's Andrew. Slightly uh, more trivial, so not for the last question, but is there any um, access situations that you haven't wanted to tell Claire about that you're just hoping would pull through, but now you feel comfortable <laughs> to say? <laughs> uh, no, or just, oh, or just really sort of... <laughs> Hair-raising access stories that pulled through or didn't. Colin, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all going brilliantly well. <laughs> oh, 
way. Everything. Is there anyone that wants to answer that question? <laughs> so, you, so what have you not always, done? Always, no, always tell your comed when your access is looking bad because otherwise you're losing sleep and actually, you, as an indie, you tend to bring your access to the people that you feel will understand you and won't shoot you for things getting wobbly. Uh, <laughs> so um, we're always very open about it. And, and the path is never entirely smooth. You know, that's the nature of the beast. Thank you to everyone on the panel, and thank you guys for coming. Thank you.